Welcome to St. Thomas Methodist Church in Clettenburg Bay. The message today is brought to you by Rev. Troy Rist. Father God, we thank you that we can come before you this morning as your church, as people who are seeking after you and seeking for you. We thank you, God, for everything that you've done to get us here, that all the places in our lives that you've ministered that you've spoken to, that you've healed, that you've comforted us, so that we can be here this Sunday morning to praise and to worship you. Father, as part of our thanks and our praise to you, we bring our gifts, our tithes, our offerings. And we just pray that you, you take the little that we have and you expand it for your kingdom to bring you glory and honor. Uh, we bring our families for prayer this morning, Lord. We pray that you bless and keep them in Jesus' name. Amen. Please have a seat. This morning we are going to continue our journey in this discussion of pride and humility. I must admit I felt the pressure this last two weeks because obviously the preaching has been scheduled for up to 12 weeks. We're doing the parables, 12 parables of Jesus. And so I knew last week that Rev, what uh, parable Rev Tim was going to be doing and that he was speaking on pride and humility. And then I saw the parable that I was going to be preaching on um, today, and I saw it was dealing with pride and humility. And immediately I went, uh-oh, what am I going to say? What am I going to say after um, Rev. Tim has preached a sermon and you've done small groups and home group discussions on pride and humility? Well, one memory I had was in Kenton, when Kenton Methodist Church for for um, one of the services, we had three Methodist ministers in the room. Can you believe it? The church was about 20 or 30 people, and we had three Methodist ministers in the room. And you know, ministers can like to speak. And it was meant to be this minister's task to preach. And he preached, and he did a fantastic sermon. He went over time, a good 10, 15 minutes, and then he sat down, and lo and behold, the other Methodist minister stood up. And he then, for some reason, felt the need to preach another 10, 15 minutes. And you know that, that saying, um, things are finished when the fat lady sings? And the one member in the congregation said to me, he's like, when the fat lady has sung and sit down, no one's meant to sit up and speak. And, he, and we thought, well, why did this Methodist minister do that? So I kind of felt like that. So I'm not calling my, uh, my dad a, a fat lady who sings. I'm just saying, has he sung the song already? Uh, how am I meant to carry on after that? But the parable for today is in Luke chapter 14, and really trusting that this parable is going to teach us something different from last week. So my goal is not to re-preach and re-say what has been said last week, but just trusting that this parable will teach you something new, something different about humility and pride that you can take on into your journey with, with God. And so I hope, I'm trusting that after this the sermon, at least one of you will say, okay, Troy, you did it, or God did it through you. We learned something new about humility. Um, and then I'll say, phew, praise the Lord, um, and we'll go from there. But the, the parable today is a parable of a wedding feast. And Jesus uses this parable of the wedding feast at a dinner party. So he's at a dinner party, and he's speaking about a wedding feast. So I'd like to ask you, for everyone who's been married, what was your wedding feast like? Whether you had it um, at night or maybe lunchtime, what was your wedding feast like? If you haven't been married, what was the best dinner party that you've been to like? What was the atmosphere like, the food, the company? What was the music like? Where did everyone sit? Was there a seating chart? Did people have to come and be told that's where your seat is according to this chart? Were there placemats on the tables that you had to go and look for? where to sit. We've got a photo here of, um, we should have a photo there, that is at Enrico's of uh, a feast that I had with, well, Taylor and I had of our wedding party. So our wedding party was only about 30 people and we thought, you know what, on the Saturday of our wedding, we don't want it to be awkward because it's only 30 people. We want it to be a very nice, relaxed affair. So we said, well, the Friday night, why don't we all go to Enrico's? We'll put three or four tables together we can all just sit there and have a good time, get to know each other, people can interact. And then on the Saturday at the wedding, um, it's not awkward, everyone knows each other already. And so that was my uh, sort of wedding, or my and Taylor's uh, wedding experience. No seating charts, no formal things, just coming together and, and having a good time. 
But what was your wedding experiences like or your dinner parties like? I'm sure some of us have had good experiences and others have had terrible experiences. Uh, Maybe some of us avoid dinner at the in-laws because we know what it's going to be like. But before we get to the wedding parable at the dinner party in Luke chapter 14, we have to understand the history that has led to that dinner party because this is a dinner party with a serious history. If we just start by reading there, we think, okay, yeah, Jesus was sitting with the Pharisees and the lawyers and they were eating food and that's nice. But we've got to understand the build up to this because there's a lot in the background here um, of this dinner party. So we need to go back, right back to uh, Luke chapter 5. And when I said this in the first service, one of the ladies were like, right, and she got out her Bible and she, she paged to Luke chapter 5 and I thought, okay, now I better get my facts straight. So I'm going to see if anyone's going to go to Luke chapter 5 and fact check to me. Is this really there? But the first time the Pharisees and the lawyers begin to interact with Jesus is in Luke chapter 5. He's having a dinner party. Um, You'll see that's a key theme throughout Luke. At the house of a tax collector named Levi. And there's lots of other tax collectors there. And the Pharisees see this. They see, okay, Jesus is eating with tax collectors and other sinners And they're not happy with that. And they begin to grumble amongst themselves. Jesus really shouldn't be rubbing shoulders with those people in society, with the the tax collectors. And then things begin to escalate. It starts with grumbling. And as the story goes, things get more and more tense, more and more awkward. The Pharisees see that the disciples are picking corn on the Sabbath. And so they go up to Jesus and say, but hang on, that's not allowed in the law of Moses. You can't work on the Sabbath. So shouldn't you be telling them to stop, to not pick corn? And then they notice that Jesus and his disciples don't fast as John and his disciples fast. And so they confront Jesus about that. Why don't you fast as John the the Baptist fasts? And then they notice that Jesus might be healing on the Sabbath. And, oh, that's really against the law of Moses. Jesus, you can't be doing that healing on the Sabbath. That's not right. So the tension grows a little bit more. And then there's a lady, a sinful woman, we are told, that comes to Jesus and anoints his feet. And Jesus touches her. And you're, Jesus, you can't touch her. You can't touch this sinful woman. You know that? That's just not what we do. That's not how these teachers, we, we interact. You can't be touching her feet. And then they notice that Jesus regularly eats dinner with these tax collectors, with these sinners. And so they begin to call him a drunkard and a glutton. That's who you are, Jesus. You're a drunkard and a glutton. And eventually... In Luke chapter 7, we get to the point where they outright challenge his authority. They say, right, Jesus, we don't know what authority you have to be doing these things. You're doing such strange things, things that really go against what we believe. We don't know what authority you're doing. So please tell us, what is your authority that you are acting on? This is is just really strange to us. What I find really ironic in Luke chapter 7 is that Luke tells us, the audience, that the Pharisees have deliberately rejected the purpose of God. Now, I find that ironic is because one translation of the word Pharisee is to be separated from or detached from everything that's impure and um, unrighteous and that's not devoted to God. So they were meant to detach themselves from everything that could compromise their devotion to God. And and yet Luke tells us here in chapter 7 that they've specifically, deliberately detached themselves from God's purpose. They've separated themselves from God's purpose. So let me ask you this. Why did they invite Jesus to a dinner party then in Luke chapter 14 if they've deliberately set themselves outside of the purpose of God? What is that dinner party all about? And so the tension begins to grow a little bit more. And then we get in Luke chapter 11, the first dinner that Jesus has specifically with the Pharisees. Up until now, the Pharisees have seen him eating with other people, and now he eats specifically with them in Luke chapter 11. And at this dinner, things really get incredibly tense. Things really get incredibly, incredibly tense. Jesus looks at the Pharisees and he says, right, Pharisees, you look good on the outside, you look clean on the outside, but you're actually full of greed and corruption. Have any of you had someone say that to you at a dinner party before? Were you sitting at your wedding feast and the host turns around to you and says, you're full of greed and corruption? He says to the Pharisees, you've neglected the love of God. You've neglected the justice of God. He even says to the Pharisees, you look innocent on the outside, but you're like unmarked grave 
unmarked graves that people walk over. In other words, Pharisees, you are so dead on the inside that when people come into contact with you, they are defiled. They become um, impure. That's how dead you are on the inside. Has anyone called you an unmarked grave before? I'm saving that for the next time someone bumps my car at pick and pay and doesn't leave a note. Just saying to my wife, we've bumped shoulders with an unmarked grave here. But that's what he says to the Pharisees. You are so spiritually dead that people are actually defiled just by coming into contact with you. That is what you are like. And he says this directly to their faces at a dinner party. Can you imagine what that must have been like, that type of confrontation? It's definitely not what my wedding feast was like, and I hope that wasn't what your wedding feast was like either, or your dinner parties. And then the lawyers at the dinner party turn around to Jesus and they say, hang on, you're also insulting us by saying these things. You're also offending us. How do you think Jesus responded to that? He turned to the lawyers and he said, woe to you lawyers as well, and then he seriously dug into them. He didn't let them off the hook. That was their first dinner that they had together. What do you think is happening at this dinner in Luke chapter 14? Do you see why we need to talk about this history to understand this parable? Between Luke chapter 11 and 14, he tells us that the Pharisees and the lawyers were deliberately waiting for Jesus to mess up. That's what they were doing. So they were deliberately following Jesus wherever he went. They were watching him. They were listening to him for any moment that he would slip up so that they could arrest him. That was their agenda. That was their goal. So let me ask you again, why did these Pharisees invite Jesus to a dinner party in Luke chapter 14? It can't be because they liked him. It can't be because they agreed with him. It can't be because they were acting according to the purpose of God. No, they had stepped aside from that. They were deliberately trying to get Jesus arrested. That is what this dinner party was. They either had a plan to get him arrested and they were going to implement it, or they were looking for an another opportunity for Jesus to mess up. And yet Jesus still goes to the dinner party. Isn't that remarkable? Jesus knows all of this, and yet he still goes to this dinner party. And then in Luke chapter 14, verse 1, we realize what the trap is. It's a Sabbath day, and they bring someone in with dropsy. His limbs are swollen. And the trap is, will Jesus heal this man on the Sabbath in front of these experts of the law so that they can get him arrested? Or will he crumble in some way, sin in some other way that they can use to discredit him? That is the trap. And Jesus heals this man, and then he turns the situation around onto the, the Pharisees and the lawyers. He lets them know that actually he's not the one here that's being hunted. They're the ones being hunted. He's not the, the one being questioned. They are. And he responds to them in a way that leaves them speechless, leaves them utterly speechless. And this is where we get this parable. This is where the parable of the wedding feast comes in that teaches us, that teaches us about humility. So why in that moment do you think Jesus spoke specifically about humility? Right? Jesus could have said anything after all that conflict, after all that tension, after that trap that they've just tried to, to spring on him. Jesus could have used any lesson here, and he specifically uses this lesson on humility, because the sin of the, of the Pharisees is the sin of pride. And I won't say much about pride, I'll just say, go watch last week's sermon, because Rev Tim really gets into pride and self-righteousness. But what we're seeing here is that pride deliberately puts us against God. That is why the Pharisees essentially and the lawyers were against God, because of pride. And Jesus is trying to still get them to change their way. And he realizes that humility can do that. And so let's read about humility here. What is Jesus telling us specifically about humility and how we can practice humility in our lives here? So it says, When Jesus noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you're invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, 
move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And we read about that last line last week as well. So the first thing to ask, as Jesus says here, he noticed how the guests chose the, the chief places. What did Jesus no- notice? What did he observe at that dinner party? Well, some translations say places of honor. Others say chief places. Others say chief couches. See, throughout Luke's gospel, he tells us that Jesus liked to recline at the table. How do you recline at a table if you're sitting in one of these red chairs? You'd have to slouch quite badly to recline, wouldn't you? Or to sit in a pew or something like that. At these dinner parties, you had um, these couches like these in the picture that let you recline uh, so that you could really relax and, and eat. And what Jesus noticed is that how people would struggle and fight for these chief places, these chief couches. See, the host had the best place. The host was seated there with, at the best place with the, the chief couch, and the honored guest was to the left. Everyone else wanted to sit as close to them as possible. Why? Because the seat, the couch, was a status symbol. The closer you got to the host, the more important you were, the more respected you were, the more honored you were, the higher you were um, in the society, in that community. If you could get closer to the, the host, you could improve your social status. You could do better business. You would have more respect. The seat gave you that. And so everyone was struggling to get as close to the host as possible for that social status, for that respect and that honor in the eyes of those around them. And he has a really, really um, strange thing, to me at least, is that the host obviously invited everyone, didn't he? The host knew who was more important within the, within the, the society, who should be seated, seated closer to him, and yet he doesn't seat them. There's no seating chart. There's no name tags on the table. So what do people do? They have to struggle and fight to get as close to the host as possible. And that is what the host does. He just lets them come in and lets them struggle and fight and contend for the seat closest to him. It sounds like a bit of a contest, don't you think? How can you argue your way, shove your way, fight your way to the top where the host is seated? That is something that Jesus would have observed. And here's the thing, you could fight and argue and work your way up as close to the host as possible, but one commentator says that the more important the guests, the later they would arrive for the dinner party. And so you could have this situation where you fight your way up, you do all that hard work, and then a more important guest arrives later than you, and then what does the host say to you? He says, look, you've overreached your position here. You're not as important as you think you are. You shouldn't be here. That's where you belong, down at the bottom of the table. Do you mind standing up and getting back to where you belong? That host there actually deserves more than you. That is what Jesus would have noticed. Sorry, Derek, should I pause for a bit? Okay. So that is something that Jesus would have have noticed in this uh, dinner party. And this is a group of men, right? This is the Pharisees and lawyers were a group of men, highly educated, highly respected in society, fighting over seats at a dinner party, Ladies, I hope your men don't behave like this at home. I hope your husbands don't behave this way at home. I hope your dinner parties and stuff don't operate this way at home as well. But that is something that Jesus would have observed, fighting over the places there. And so what we see here is that pride, pride is wanting to live for the other person's respect, for the other person's honor. Pride is living for the status that other people give us. And now this can be in a very brutish way of, I want the bigger car, I want the foster car, I want the house, I want the, on the, the corner office in my workplace because of the status that it gives us. It can be that way. Pride can be like that. But pride can be something as well like serving in the church. 
Wherever we are doing things to try lift ourselves up in the eyes of others, Jesus says that's the pride of the Pharisees over here. And so why does Troy preach on a Sunday? Is it so he can get a pat on the back after the service? Well, that would be pride. Why do the worship team um, play on the Sunday? Is it so that others can look at them and be like, wow, look how talented they are? Jesus would say that is the pride of the Pharisees. And so Jesus here says that by practicing a very specific um, form of humility, a very specific way of being humble, it can help us overcome this, this challenge of pride. And here we see that what humility is, is deliberately placing ourselves below others. So humility is, is deliberately taking the lowest seat in the room, the lowest seat at the table. It's that conscious choice to say, okay, I'm not going to put myself above others, but I'm going to deliberately place others above myself. And now I was thinking this week, you know, that's a nice parable, um, 2,000 years old. What is a very practical, modern-day example that we can use to get the story back? And I experienced, uh, I think, a modern-day version of this uh, when I was studying at Rhodes University, I was in my first year um, studying jazz, so I was about 19 years old then, trying to figure out this crazy music style called jazz. And I was very blessed or fortunate for the music department to have organized some of the top jazz musicians, not only in our country but in the world, to come to little old Grahamstown with our no water and electricity. You think, we think we've got things bad in Pletch with no electricity. Let me tell you, in Grahamstown, you don't have any water and electricity. It really tests you there. And they not only performed for us, but they will also stay on for the next day to give us classes, to chat and interact with us. Uh, we had Andre Peterson on the piano. I mean, he played at Carnegie Hall, um, but he sadly passed away from COVID due to COVID illness in 20, obviously 2020, 2021 type of pianist that you'll never get another one of him in our generation, one of a kind. Had Kessif and Naidu on the drums, he's now in Sweden, doing amazing things there. Had Shane Cooper on the upright bass, uh, he was a National Jazz Artist Musician of the Year at one stage. And then we had Faye Faku on the trumpet, South African jazz legend, traveled the world, um, played with some of the great musicians, some of the greatest musicians in the world. And they came to, to Rhodes and they they performed for us, and then, as I said, the next day, we had a chance to interact with them. Well, on that day, Faya Falku, the trumpeter, was a little bit late, only 10 or 15 minutes late. And he walks in that room, and he does what we all do when you walk into the room. He looks for a seat to sit in, and he realizes there's no empty seats in the room. There's nowhere for him to sit. And now I see him looking for a seat, and I do that motion, you know, I'm standing up for you, come take my seat. And he very quickly looks at me, and he goes, I don't know, sit down, sit down. So I'm like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit down. And he walks past everyone, past me, and he sits directly on the floor next to me with his back against the wall. One of the greatest musicians in our country did not want to take a seat from a 19-year-old first-year jazz student, but decided to sit on the floor instead. And then he proceeded to teach us from his seat on the floor. He didn't just sit there, he taught us, taught us from there. I mean, if he had looked at me and said, would you mind giving me your seat? Every single person in the room would have understood, right? I'd have been like, yes, no, of course. I mean, if anyone deserves a seat, it's, it's you, come take the seat. Yet he wouldn't even take the seat when it was offered to him. He placed himself below us. That for me is what I remember when I read this parable, how to practice humility even though a great man like that would not take a seat away from me. He said, no, you sit, I'll sit on the floor. How do we do that in our everyday lives? How can we practice humility like that in our everyday lives? Think about your, your workplace environment at the moment. Think about your family. Think about your place in the church, in the community, at schools, wherever you are. Think about how can you do that? How can you place others above yourself in that way? I think what's very important here is to be aware of what Jesus is not saying in this parable. Because quite often we can make Jesus say things he never said at all, can't we? Jesus is not saying here that humility means we depreciate ourselves. It does not mean we put ourselves down, that we make ourselves less. It doesn't mean we view ourselves as not as good and valuable and as important as other people. 
That's not what Jesus is saying here. He's not saying you sit at the worst seat because you're not as good and talented as other people. Jesus is also not saying here that we mustn't pursue big things. If we mustn't pursue um, being jazz music legends, that we mustn't pursue being CEOs of companies, that we mustn't have big dreams, audacious dreams and desires and goals, that we mustn't strive for gold medals and breaking records and all of that type of stuff. That is not what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is just asking us, what is the motivation for what we're doing? That's essentially what he's saying. He's saying if the motivation is so that we can get that respect and an appreciation of others, so that we can be regarded more highly in the eyes of those around us, then Jesus says, that's pride. That is pride. But if he's saying, you're doing all of that out of service for God, he says that is humility. How do we know if what we're doing is out of service for God? We put others above ourselves. That's how I know that Faye Falco was there, how we all knew he was there, to be a great musician, because he didn't take the greatest seat. He sat on the floor, and he taught us from the floor. And that showed all of us, hang on, this guy's not interested in respecting and honor and all of the other glory stuff. He's just interested in teaching us. He's interested in being a musician. If we're interested in serving God, we would live that way as well. We'd live in a way that we're not trying to lift ourselves up, God. We're lifting others up above us. Does that make sense so far? Have you followed me there? The pride that Jesus is speaking is the pride of lifting ourselves up in the eyes of others, and we combat that by deliberately placing others above ourselves. I'd like to just bring things to a close with with this, is that Jesus not only tells us to live this way, but Jesus deliberately lived this way as well. This is how Jesus lived. You cannot read the Gospels and not encounter Jesus living this way. If you think about it, Jesus was with God in heaven, wasn't he? He was up there, and he could have stayed up there and saying, okay, you guys just need to figure things out and worship me and honor me and respect me. But no, what does Jesus do? He deliberately comes down to us. And what does he do while he's here? He serves us. Jesus came to serve, not to be served. Jesus came and he washed his disciples' feet. He didn't have them wash his feet. Jesus deliberately placed people above himself in that sense. Does that mean he made himself less of a Messiah, less of a person, less of God? No. It just means that he uplifted those around him. So Jesus tells us to live this way, but then he also deliberately lived this way. And lastly, this is how God seems to run his kingdom. What I mean by that is notice in this parable that Jesus doesn't say, okay, look, Pharisees, this is not important to God. There's no seating arrangement in God's kingdom. God's not interested where you sit, so just sit anywhere. Jesus doesn't say that. In fact, Jesus says, God is going to do this as well. God is going to seat people, exalt them by seating them closer to the host, and humble them by seating them further away from the host. God is going to do this. The seating arrangement is important. The difference is God does it according to how we practice humility. So this is not only what Jesus tells us to do. This is not only how Jesus lived. But this also seems to be how God runs his kingdom. He exalts those who humble themselves, and he humbles those who exalt themselves. And so we've got a little bit of an unavoidable uh, truth, if I call it, an unavoidable choice with us this morning, is we can either exalt ourselves, then Jesus says, okay, that's fine, exalt yourselves, but just understand that one day God is going to humble you. Or we can choose to humble ourselves now, and then Jesus says, that's great, because one day God is going to exalt you at his appointed time. It's going to happen. How it happens is up to us. That is the choice that we get to make in our lives. That's the, that's the decision that is left for us. And so how can we practice humility this week? Reflect on your life. Reflect on where you're at and ask yourself this question. How can I take the lowest seat by lifting others up? How can I not pursue social status, pursue, pursue that appreciation of being in the community? How can I not do things in the church because oh, people are going to see me and they're going to think I'm a good Christian? How can we do things in a way that it's not about what others think of us, 
but it's all about how we can serve God. How can we practice humility in that way? When I, shared, uh, when I spoke with you, I shared that story of the car guards. Remember that? I'm going to carry the car guards forward with me this week. How can I be humble with the car guards by not placing myself above them? But saying, actually, I'm going to lift you up in my life now as well and place you above me. That's practicing humility. And you, I hope you can see you can do this in every area of your life. Families, friends, churches, work, school, wherever it is. So I leave that task with you. Is that doable? Are you comfortable with that? We will say a mighty amen and amen. Thank you for joining us in listening to this message. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. In this way, you will be notified when the next message is available. Until next week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace.